Wolf Pack, what is going on? Your boy, the Wolf of Roto Street, RotoStreetJournal.com, where we breed and feed fantasy wolves, is back for round two of the NFL free agency fallout show. Last week we had over an hour and a half. It was incredible. We had plenty of people, over 600 people watched it all the way through. So whoever you sickos are, thanks so much. We appreciate that support. We hope to have another successful video, but not nearly as long because we are now in wave two of the free agency fallout period. So there's going to be less names to talk about here, but still some humongous names. Gurley, Emmanuel Sanders, you know, Melvin Gordon, Gordon, some huge fallouts from last Friday on to today. We're going to be here to break them all down and, of course, the depth you expect from us in the Roto Street Journal. What's going on, CJ? Thanks for coming in, tuning in with us. Any likes, comments, shares, all that good stuff is always greatly appreciated to help us get discovered as we turn through this offseason together. And, of course, hopefully you're all healthy and safe, practicing that good social distancing so we can flatten this curve and all get back to our normal lives. But thankfully, again, we've had some free agency distract us, and I'm going to tell you all the important breakdowns that you need to know of all these major names, starting at the top with probably the biggest name and maybe the biggest surprise of free agency so far, that's Todd Gurley. Now, before we get into him too, I just want to make sure I give that general preface I always do before a free agency show. Under half of these free agents historically have been better in their new homes than they were the year before. Even less than that have actually outperformed their ADPs because so many people get all horny and excited like I am right now for these free agents and they ultimately fail to live up to the lofty expectations we create for them. But oftentimes the ones who do return to their homes, the Drakes, the Derrick Henrys we talked about last week, do not only just perform as well but exceed what they had been doing the years prior. So there are some positives and then more so too in the second guy on this list on the menu, you see there like Daryl Henderson, lots of times people leave and open up humongous opportunities for the running backs, the receivers behind them. So we have tons of names to break down. Some people were revisiting from last week just because they're that much better. And after I give this preface of to why, as CJ just commented there, I can't wait to suck them all off and tell you why they're all going to be so great in their new homes. So settle on in. Let me know, of course, any questions you have. I am more than happy to answer them all. And thanks so much for joining us here. And if you're listening to the podcast, of course, Fancy Fullback Dive, where we pave your path to 2019 titles. Uh, thanks so much for that. And we'd love to have you join the live broadcast on Facebook uh, so we get that interaction as it happens. But let's start with Todd Gurley here and what he's going to be bringing in his new home, the Atlanta Falcons. Now, once he got released, which was shocking enough, but you looked at the huge cap hit that he was going to come with, it, it makes sense that they ultimately could not commit to this guy for too much longer, Todd Gurley. Uh, and then once he got cut, it was like, where is he going to go? There's really only two to three spots that I would have loved to see him go to. One of them was the Bucks. They still had that huge vacancy, but the other was the Falcons because they had the fifth most vacated volume of any team in terms of just sheer carries, 190, well over half of the total from last year opened up because Devonta Freeman is now gone. But even more so, and especially for Gurley's game, they have the most targets available in the NFL. 261 vacated looks. We're going to dig more into that with Calvin Ridley in a little bit. But that's ridiculous with Austin Hooper and, and Devonta Freeman vacating 167 total between just them. That's that intermediate range of the field where we know Gurley does some of his best damage. So ultimately, the volume is going to be there. The contract I love here too, a one-year proof it five year five million dollar rental style deal tells you they're not going to be afraid to ride this horse into the ground uh they're really going to give it to Gurley. unlike when if he had stayed in la they're conservative they're preserving him to try to get him to maximize that long stupid contract they signed here it's just a rental let's get the most we can out of this horse slap him on the ass as many times as we can and feed him up the gut into the, the passing game, everything possible. So there's tons of volume there. There's no incentive to not give it all to Gurley. Who are they going to give it to? Brian Hill, Quadri Olson, Ito Smith. Like, who the fuck are these creatures? Like, let's be real here. There's nothing decent on this roster outside of Todd Gurley. There's tons of volume to him. And he was running behind the third worst, according to Pro Football Focus, line last year. And obviously, that had a huge impact on him. He was behind the sixth best the two years before they lose Saffold and two of their other starters. And it was just brick wall after brick wall. The guy could not shake free. 
this line, not incredible. They were right around 20th in Pro Football Focus's ratings, but they are all first rounders here. Maybe it's like the Titans where they took a year to gel. They all come through. This isn't without negatives, though. It's not like Gurley's in this perfect world here in Atlanta. Won the scheme. Dirk Cutter, very pass happy. The most attempts in the league last year. And that's been the story for the decade with the Bucks, uh, with the Falcons before here. The last time we saw a run-heavy offense with Dirk Cutter was with the Jags. That was 2011, nearly a decade ago. And that was the last time he really had a relevant running back outside of a random Doug Martin 20, 2005, I think it was, something ridiculous. He busted out uh, for, for you know 1,500 yards or something crazy. So we haven't had a good running back under Cutter. Very pass-happy guy. More concerning, though, as you all know with Todd Gurley, is the health. The knee, the arthritic knee here, uh, which could just plague him all season. It clearly limited him last year in his 19 last games since injuring that knee in 2018. He only has one 100-yard game in that span. Uh, He has career lows last year in carries, 223, yards, 857, yards per attempt, under four for the first time since Jeff Fisher, 3.8. 1,064 rush uh, total yards from scrimmage, just a far cry from the 2,000-yard guy we have become used to. But he's still a touchdown beast. He's running behind a better offensive line. There's tons of volume here available for the guy. I ultimately probably won't own Gurley in a ton of leagues because there's so many exciting young runners, healthy guys, Miles Sanders, Devin Singletary, that have that same upside. Um, But still, Gurley has that huge touchdown upside. The offense is explosive. Don't be shocked. You know, I'm going to pass on him. He might make me regret it in the best situation he's been in in quite some time. It's a lot about Gurley. Let me know what your thoughts are on this guy and if you'll ever touch him in these coming weeks. Next up, we got Daryl Henderson, who's left behind here from Todd Gurley. Uh, the, the third round pick last year who Les Snead was comparing to Alvin Kamara when he was coming out. He was saying, we cannot pass up on this guy because he gives you that Kamara element. We're going to regret it if we don't take him. We're going to feel it when we play against him. And they absolutely love this guy, Daryl Henderson. And what's not to love here about Daryl Henderson? So explosive coming out. I get he, you know, wasted rookie year. Let's chuck this one out of here. Uh, it, ultimately, nothing last year. And there's still no real clarity as to why. Sean McVay always so vague. But when they they scouted him, they loved everything about, one, the fit inside the zone-blocking scheme. The guy averaged over 10 yards per carry on outside zone, and no team runs more outside zone than the Rams. Racked up 1,909 yards and only 214 carries. That's 8.23 yards per clip in college while accumulating 22 touchdowns, the most plays of 40 yards and 50 yards over the last two years. The guy defines explosiveness. He just never really got a chance to throw it out there and show it, but compared often to Dalvin Cook by our guy Dane Brugler and many other guys for his zone instincts, his ability to put the foot in the ground and just get going. Henderson, man, he has all the talent to thrive in here. He's a great receiver too for what McVay wants to do with marrying the pass and run games. But why did he only touch it 43 times? Why did he play 10% or fewer snaps in all but three games, never topping 43% if he's this perfect of a fit? It's a mystery, and we don't know why, but they had to have felt somewhat comfortable where Henderson was going to release Gurley the way they did. And when he did get the work, seven touches, then 12, then 13, he really started to thrive. He was averaging over seven yards per touch and starting to really show what he could do. On that limited work, he forced a missed tackle on 25% of his carries. That was the most of anybody with the the same type of workload. Not a ton of work, small sample size, but still showing that talent. Uh, Daryl Henderson. Now, is it going to be Malcolm Brown? That's who they went to first. Played 67.5% of the snaps when Gurley first missed week six. Then he got hurt, and we started to see Henderson's role go up. But they first went to to Malcolm Brown. He's a bulldozer. Probably going to be the goal line guy regardless. Even still, he brings so much Henderson. More talent, more explosiveness, more upside to the table. And if they were comparing this guy to Kamara not too long ago... Maybe they still will give this guy a Kamara-style role, especially with Gurley now removed from the picture. They have the, the third most, vo- or second now, vacated volume out of any team. So he's up to my running back 28, uh, Daryl Henderson is, with room to rise, assuming they don't make any more huge moves. But on a team starved for draft picks, on a team with you know t- 
already loaded the position. They traded up to get this guy. They love him. I really hope they finally give him the work to show because he can explode like very few backs in this league. So Daryl Henderson, make sure you're moving him up your rankings list. I see your questions coming in, guys. Don't worry. I've I've got the mailbag on the menu. I promise to get there. Uh, But first, a sip of water. Our next guy, first receiver that we're going to talk about here, Emmanuel Sanders. What a absolutely gorgeous and perfect fit. You could not ask for a better landing spot than the New Orleans Saints. And that's for a number of reasons. The biggest two, and exactly what Emmanuel Sanders said himself, Sean Payton and Drew Brees, the play caller and the man executing the scheme, are both still at extremely high levels, especially Payton, probably the most creative guy in the NFL right now, uh, most pass happy mind over the last decade. He is ridiculous. Breeze is insane. And this offense is going to thrive with Sanders now added to it, a complete juggernaut. They haven't had a wide receiver duo like this since Michael Thomas and Brandon Cooks played together. And there's nothing that rivaled this before those two. This is the most dangerous tandem maybe they've ever had. And we've seen just ridiculous bonanzas with far less Uh, at their disposal. We could really see a return of Drew Brees to that 5,000-yard, 40-touchdown style Brees. This has not been that same Saints offense over these last few years. They've been much more run-heavy. They've gone from, let me pull out this stat here real quickly for you guys. Um, Over the the first years, um, until 2017, the Saints had ranked top five in pass attempts in 10 of 11 seasons under Peyton. The one time they weren't was 2009 when they actually made it to the Super Bowl, won the Super Bowl that year. Uh, And they've been emulating that more run-heavy, more balanced style scheme over these last few seasons, um, ranking 19th, 15th, and 13th in pass attempts these last three seasons since they got Kamara, since they had better running backs. So ultimately, they've been a little bit of a far cry from those pass-happy area bonanzas. But you look at it, it makes kind of sense. They add Kamara, a much more dangerous runner, and then they've got the only Michael Thomas to throw to, it makes sense from a personnel standpoint why they might get away from those tacks. So yeah, they'd probably be still a little more balanced, won't be back to those top five ways, those top two and eight of those 10 seasons as well uh, in terms of pass attempts. Maybe not quite that level, but still, I wouldn't be surprised to see them get closer to that than they have been in these last three years with Sanders. Now back to his own value. My good God, he can play inside, he can play outside, he runs the entire route tree, he can get deep, averaging nearly 14 yards per catch once he went over to San Fran with those 4-4 wheels. The guy does everything you'd want and more. And Nick Underhill, one of our favorite beat writers, pointed out that they never pay up at wide receiver, yet this was the one player who fit the Saints' one need more than anyone else. They've never had a number two like this in so long. Who was it before? Ted Ginn, you know, Trey Quan Smith. They have been aching for a number two wide receiver. They finally get it with Emmanuel Sanders. Fits this perfectly. And even though he's a number two, might even be better for him. He's going to feast on that number two coverage. You can't double the guy when you got Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara also coming out of that backfield. So he's now one of my top 30 wide receivers. Explodes up the big board. Uh, 60th overall, so right in that fifth round range. I'd probably rather take an upside sophomore like, let's say, Debo Samuel, who's left behind here, maybe Terry McLaurin. But even still, even though it's a little unsexier, I would not be shocked at all to see Emmanuel Sanders outperform all of that entire sexy sophomore class. Speaking of sexy, not longer sophomores, but now we're talking about juniors, third year here in the system. That's Calvin Ridley, who I'm labeling right now the 2020 Chris Godwin. The hype's going to be unreal. Everybody's going to love this guy. He's going to go price out of the world in the round four, and then he's going to outperform that by two to three rounds because he's going to be an absolute monster this year. Why is he going to be like Godwin besides seeing a lot of hype, besides uh, being that guy everyone wants? is the fact that they both are in very pass-happy attacks. Uh, Bucks were number two last year. The, the Falcons were number one, the one team to beat him. And there was tons of vacated volume. We saw Godwin eat up with Humphreys and Deshaun Jackson moving on. This year, nobody has vacated more targets than the Atlanta Falcons, a whopping 261, 67 more than the next closest team, the Jets, and nearly 40% 
of last year's total targets are now up for grabs. Will Gurley, who we talked about, grab some of that? Yes. Will, you know, the Broad and Hayden Hurst take some of Austin Hooper's targets? Sure. But you have to imagine that our guy here, Calvin Ridley, is going to feast now with these guys gone. In only three games without Hooper last year, uh, so just Hooper removed, not even the running backs, but Hooper removed, we saw Ridley go from a wide receiver 24 pace in fantasy football, 875 yards, 8 TDs, 66 receptions, 201 points or so. That's what he was on pace for with Hooper in the lineup. Without Hooper in the lineup, only three games, but this guy was on pace for 117 receptions on 171 targets, 1,701 yards, and 11 TDs. That's 353 PPR points, folks. That would have been the wide receiver, too. Much better than Julio Jones if he was the only guy uh, without Hooper in that lineup last year. So obviously, you can't just say three-game sample. It's going to automatically extrapolate to next year. No. But still, with a blazing 4-4, 340, beautiful routes that can just hit every single layer. Just like I was talking about Sanders, but now a younger version of him. And you got Julio Jones, 31, always dealing with some sort of injuries. You never know how healthy Gurley's going to be. To me, Ridley's going to be bathed in targets like he's never been bathed before. And this guy has always dominated uh, with, with the volume whenever he gets it. We've seen small glimpses of that. I think we're going to get a full season of it. Book it right now. The 2020 Chris Godwin is going to be Calvin Ridley, and you're going to want him on all of your teams. And talking about breakouts, talking about guys you're going to want on your team, we've been pretty good. We missed Lamar Jackson last year, but the year before we got Mahomes, and we're pretty good at identifying late-round QBs. About to deliver you the next cheat code for late-round price. Yep, that late-round cheat code QB, going to be Teddy Bridgewater in 2020. I just spent uh, a ton of time digging in earlier this offseason to Joe Brady's offense. I know we hinted at this on the last podcast. So what's changed or what can we summarize or explain a little bit better here? Well, Joe Brady comes from LSU and anybody who watched any shred of college football is well aware of how this entire offense just absolutely exploded. Let me cite these stats for you real quick. I didn't have them last time for you. So just hear how insane this is. LSU went from 69 ninth in scoring and 65th in total passing to then first in the nation, the most prolific offense of potentially all time, going to an insane 568 yards, 48.4 points per game, and only behind Washington State in passing, and that was 401.6 yards per game. Per game. Just a ridiculous onslaught of offense after, again, 69th to tops in the nation and historic paces, and who benefited the most? Joe Burrow went from 2,777 yards to nearly doubling that, going to 5,671 and 60 TDs after chucking, um, you know, what was it, 25 the year before? 44 more TDs in a single season. Just a ridiculous, ridiculous, again, almost 3,000 more yards and almost 44 uh, and, and 44 more touchdowns. Ridiculous leap because this offense is so quarterback friendly. It's all about getting its weapons in space, quick strikes, inspired by the Saints. And where does Teddy Bridgewater come from? Where does he play these last two years? But the Saints, Joe Brady was with him. He coached Teddy Bridgewater. He was a huge in his development, catching him up to speed. So obviously he already knows the cerebral nature, the student of the game that Bridgewater is. He already knows that Bridgewater can operate the system, quick strike, rhythmic passing, precision, getting it out into tight windows, anticipating the throws. That's all Bridgewater's strengths. A lot of people, oh, well, he can't throw the deep ball. He's, you know, six point eight yards per attempt is third worst over the last four years. I get it. The guy doesn't like to drive the ball too deep, but you got to unpeel that and look a little bit deeper here as to what throws he succeeds in. Those are the quick strike high percentage, which his offense thrives. And even more so, he can sling the deep ball, but he's so much better at the anticipation deep balls, the, the hitches, the ins, the outs. That's what Brady does. It's not about go and flies. And that's where Bridgewater kind of does suck. I'll give it to you. He doesn't drive that ball deep down the field and go for one-on-one jump like most others do. He's all about the precision, the timing. He'll hit those deep balls on those style throws. I have some stats to cite that on the site, rotostreetjournal.com. Check out our breakdown 
on Bridgewater. He can throw the deep ball with those type of routes. Pro Football Focus did a great study on how after he got his legs under him, shook off the rust in those first three games as a starter, he was prolific over those last three. Had that 320-yard, four TD day against the Bucks, Threw seven touchdowns across those four games to only one interception while averaging 280 pass yards per game. And now is in a system Taylor made to his strengths has a weapons cabinet that just got what's new. Was I was just gonna just talk about all this, you know. Again, background established. Now he gets Robbie Anderson added to this. Probably the the last of the prize jewel free agents runs a four three one forty, similar to you know to DJ Moore four four. You got Curtis Samuel four three one as well. This offense all about getting speed into space is how Brady describes it. Well, he's got plenty of it, and especially more, and. Uh, and Curtis Samuel, very deadly with the ball in their hands, almost like running backs, extensions of the run game. And of course, how, how could I not forget Christian McCaffrey, the all-world MVP style player here, deadly with the ball in his hands and in space. So between the weapons, the system, everything about it, I'm telling you, I'd rather have Teddy Bridgewater next year than Aaron Rodgers and nearly every other QB. He's top 12, in my opinion, a QB1 who I'm all about next year. Let's hear what you guys have to say so far. What questions, comments, everything you guys got. I'm going to pull up the fallers so you can see it, but I want to address anything you guys are bringing to the table here. Um, Flum Blitzcraig with Gurley says Nate Shaw. Absolutely. Ram that guy in. Run him to the ground. I, it's crazy he's only 25, as CJ says. Uh, it's, it's insane. He has the knees of a 65-year-old. That's the risk with him, of course. Uh, it's definitely... Far from a guarantee that this guy's going to eat and dominate it. But man, uh, he's, th- he's still in that situation. Tons of volume, tons of TD chances. I would not be surprised to see the best system yet. No mention of Adam Schefter giving us the inside scoop. I, you're, you're right, CJ. I should have. He said that they loved him more than any other player. The most explosive offensive weapon they identified in the draft. So they had to trade up and get him. So you're right. A very fair point to bring up here. Love the Panthers' weapons, but don't love it for Robbie Anderson. You're almost transitioning like segue as if I paid you to say that. So yes, uh, I don't love it either. We're going to talk about this uh, in a second, CJ. So hold, hold tight. Hold your horses. We're going to get there. Kyle Toons, with the Patriots not having Brady, the offensive line back healthy as well as a couple fullback, how much would you put stock into Sony Michelle? I just don't love Sony myself, Toons. I, I feel like he's had his chance and he has yet to wow us other than that you know, great playoff run. But those holes were gaping. They lose Dante Skarnacki this offseason, which is huge for that offensive line. I can't say I'm a diehard Sony Michelle fan. He's one dimensional. He gets all the receptions taken. What if you know Harris has a bigger role this year, who I like more as a pure runner? I don't love Sony. He's not. He's not in my you know must draft list by any means. And most of the time, I'm probably not going to be getting Sony uh, in draft tunes. Alrighty, folks. On to the fallers here. And as we were hinting at, CJ commented here. Robbie Anderson, definitely not the ideal landing spot for this guy. As we mentioned, DJ Moore, Curtis Samuel already here, so it's a crowded wide receiver room, and now you're spreading out these targets even further. But could it work for at least one or two of these guys? Absolutely. We talked about Joe Brady. He's all about getting at least five wide receivers or pass catchers, rather. Could be the running backs, tight ends. But he wants five routes out on every single play. He does minimum protection. Only five linemen never holds his tight end in so he can get all these guys out into space for these quick strike throws. So it fits the offense to have another deep, you know, speedy, crazy wide receiver weapon to take the top off these defenses. He needs that style guy so that underneath game is opened up. So Anderson fits it perfectly. He's going to be able to stretch safeties, open up the down underneath game for DJ Moore, for Christian McCaffrey, for even Curtis Samuel to do their damage. So it's a great win for the offense as a whole for Teddy Bridgewater, as we just talked about operating this scheme. It fits an enormous need, uh, not need necessarily because they have the deep speed already, but it gives you just another weapon to stretch everything out, uh, get those safeties playing back. But for Anderson's own value himself, man, uh, could he have gone to the wide receiver needy Eagles, for example, or a team that just, you know, the Patriots, somebody that needs a weapon that could just vacuum targets. He's not going to find that type of volume here. So he's going to be back to that maybe wide receiver three at best. When is he going to blow up? You don't really know. Because to me, he's fourth 
on this target totem pole at best. You got McCaffrey, DJ Moore, and I think Curtis Samuel slides in above him just because he fits a little bit better with what Brady wants to do. More of a runner with the ball in his hand than Robbie Anderson is. So I see him coming in fourth. There will be lots of volume. He's going to be one of the pass happiest attacks in the NFL. He's going to have his big days, but certainly could have landed in a spot where those deep wheels will be you know, more used. He could have been a number two or even number one in certain scenarios. Now he's going to probably be a number four. But he does have history with Matt Rule, who keeps bringing in his guys from Temple. So Rule's going to want to get him going. Uh, he clearly envisions a, a nice role for a guy he's already utilized well. So speed and space, Anderson certainly has plenty. He's going to have his big days. But I just, him and Samuel especially, I think, eat each other up. DJ Moore, the one guy I definitely don't think is hurt here. And I think Christian McCaffrey also helped here because the offense gets more explosive as a whole. DJ Moore does more of his damage underneath. I think this opens up that space for him to work that that intermediate range where he does just dominates eighth in the league in yards after the catch will now find more space underneath. So I think he's the least impacted, but Curtis Samuel, Robbie Anderson both drop down the big board a little bit with this landing spot. Next up, my next faller, and how far he falls is debatable, but Melvin Gordon, far from the ideal spot here, at least at initial glance here, with the Broncos. They ranked 28th in scoring last year, 17.6 points per game, nine other games under 16 points, just a dreadful overall offense last year. The line, middle of the pack, pro bowler, back-to-back 1,000-yard -back rusher and Phillip Lindsay already on the roster. Certainly there were some juicier spots, the Bucks, the Chiefs, places where Gordon could have gone, even back to the Chargers, where he would have been closer to a top 10 running back, whereas now he falls to more of a running back 16-17, in my opinion, still an RB2. And why do I like this? Why is it not just a pure ew for all the reasons I just suggested? One, Pat Shermer is the definition of a bell cow breeder, their new offensive coordinator that they brought in. In 11 of his 12 years as a head coach or offensive coordinator, Shermer's attempted to ride a singular workhorse in eight of those 11 seasons. Some of those misses, AP got suspended without a backup plan. We all know what he was fucking doing. Uh, Chip Kelly was more of the play caller in his Eagles committee. You got Peyton Hillis injured all year at the Browns. So most of those disgusting you know, committee-based scenarios had a reason. And now Mike Kliss, a beat writer out there, pretty much the, the mouthpiece of John Elway, comes out and says they signed Gordon to be their workhorse. Now, granted, could they have allocated that money to different places with greater need? Of course, you have Philip Lindsay, who I love. I will talk about him in a second. But if they're already coming out here and saying that we're going to you know, ride Melvin Gordon to be our, our horse, and the history shows that with Pat Shermer, his lead RB's average, 308 carries and 61.3 targets per season. We just saw Saquon Barkley notch 90 catches. Uh, 50, you know, seven of those 11 lead running backs have 50 plus catches under Shermer. And we know that Melvin Gordon can haul in the ball as well as any. Had over 400 yards in four straight seasons and 41 receptions. Uh, hauled in nine touchdowns last uh, or over those, that span. One of the better receiving backs, a great pass protector for executing this scheme and a great tackle breaker too. They, they talked about how they wanted someone that can churn. He broke 23.4% of his missed uh, the tackle attempts on him, which was tops in the league. Uh, yeah, he had a blemish last year after holding out, shaking off some rust, but when he is good to go two seasons ago, that Pro Bowl style year, Melvin Gordon's one of the most dangerous running backs and one of the best touchdown scorers, 47 since 2014. <laughs> Uh, 36 rushing and 11 receiving. So gets it done in every facet. A true three-down horse was the running back seven, running back five, and running back eight heading into this season. Wouldn't be shocked for another top 10 campaign. And this offensive line last year, I said middle of the pack. They were number 12, though. He goes from the 31st ranked offensive line and even worse in run blocking, dead last in the Chargers, to now the 12th ranked line. Mike Munchak, that line coach, really helped them take a next step uh, the Broncos offensive line. And that last year, 12 ranking was without their prized free agent acquisition, Jawan James, who was nasty when he was in there. Only three games, though. They also go out and pay $44 million to get arguably the best interior lineman in Graham Glasgow, one of the best on the market still out there. Uh, they went out and made sure to get him rock-solid potential offensive line. Maybe takes another step forward this year with returning some great starters and adding this beefy new talent. 
I love the line, and Drew Locke went 4-1, and one, led two of their highest scoring games on the season. Uh, so we, we'd like to see Drew Locke, again, a, a quality starter. Maybe he ignites this offense, takes them to a full season of more explosive numbers. So there is the potential for a top 10 campaign. Uh, they might do more of a one-two punch with Lindsey despite Shermer's workhorse ways. We don't know necessarily. So the initial gut reaction, disgusting. You unpeel it a little bit, and there's still a lot to like here with Melvin Gordon. I'd rather have him than, let's say, Todd Gurley, who's a more clear-cut workhorse, just because I like the younger, fresher guy in a system that's not quite as ugly as you might think at first glance. The guy who undoubtedly falls, though, is definitely Philip Lindsay. Takes a huge hit, and this one's kind of obvious. We don't need to dig in too deep here. But a guy who goes back to back, thousand yards, uh, season, you know, over two hundred and fifty touches, back to back years, is gonna struggle to see that type of volume with Melvin Gordon. He's clearly gonna be the number two, at best a one B, and inconsistent usage is gonna make him very difficult to trust on a week to week basis. All those things I like about. Melvin Gordon, the three down system, the you know, the improved offensive line, Drew Locke maybe making it more explosive, can and should help Lindsay when he gets those touches, but ultimately they're going to be far less dependable. You're not gonna know when they're coming. Ultimately, I don't like this at all for Philip Lindsay. Uh except for the fact that Melvin Gordon does have a pretty extensive injury injury uh, history here. So Philip Lindsay might ultimately become a workhorse at some point. We know he'll thrive if and when that happens. He's going to clearly be motivated. The team's not showing him the respect he deserves. I just don't see him getting close to enough volume to be dependable on a week-to-week basis. And the last faller here is Darius Geis. Why? They only did what? Sign... Peyton, Peyton Barber and J.D. McKissick. Ooh, not those two. But it just is reaffirming. You now have AP brought back. You bring in those two, again, little talents. But this is crowded. This is a logjam. And if they had faith in Darius Geis, why would you bring in four other guys to compete and potentially steal work from him? Now, I like the Scott Turner system. It's more of a workhorse base with it's about a power runner and there's very few out there that can run the ball as powerfully as Darius Geis. We saw those brief glimpses when he was healthy of that what 130 yard day uh, and only 10 to 15 touches. He can get it done. I I love the talent. But he's only lasted. He's never had more than 40 carries in a season. He can't stay healthy. And clearly the team has no faith in him bringing in these plotters to, to potentially back him up and eat work and try to keep him fresh. And to me, a gross offense as a whole already now has a log jam position. Why are you going to target that backfield? The line is decent. But ultimately, I don't see any type of reason to get into the running back market of the Washington Redskins. So as much as I love the talent, to me, it just does not seem like it's going to be unleashed this year. And now let's get back to your questions. And I've got a few questions I want to ask um, you guys. So I'd love to hear your feedback on the questions that I think remain here in free agency. But let's get to your mailbag. And then I'll pull this up uh, so you can see what those questions are. Where did I put them? Remaining names and questions. Yep, I guess those didn't save. Whoops. I'll pull those up real quick, and I'll get to your questions in one second, folks. Thank you. Where the fuck did these go? I definitely added these earlier. All righty. Well, here we are. Now you guys have them. <laughs> all righty. So that's for you guys to see. Let's get back to your questions and comments. Love, all right, with the Patriots, we just answered that. I do like Harris too, but I'm worried about Belichick waiting on younger backs. This might be a whole new offense though. It's, you know, Stiddy taking over. Um, I think I have Matt Ryan at QB9 right now, QB7, something in that range. Uh, I have him, I do have him above like Deshaun Watson or, or so, um, but I'd rather have Kyler Murray I'd, I'd rather have, you know, obviously Mahomes, Lamar Jackson. But it is, again, they led the league in pass attempts. He now has a dangerous backfield outlet. I do think losing Hooper is going to hurt in the red zone a bit. Uh, Matt Bergstein saying, um, I have DJ Moore my keeper. And I think Anderson going that doesn't hurt DJ at all. Could open up the offense more. That's, yeah, that's what I was kind of hitting at, Bergstein. Him getting the, the defensive safeties, pulling them back to give 
DJ Moore that time to roam underneath and really dominate over eight. Uh, he was eighth in the league in yards after the catch, and now should find even more space. Those two don't overlap as much as I think Curtis Samuel and Anderson uh, do. So yeah, I think it does open things up uh, for DJ Moore. Brady has a brain, which he does. He'll use Samuel or use at OSU underneath and quick stuff could eat. So yeah, I, I mean, it's I, I do think Samuel fits this offense really well too. To me, uh, it goes DJ, it goes McCaffrey, DJ Moore. Samuel, then Anderson, but Anderson fits that role so well in terms of stretching the field. I know it's early, but where would you see K. Drake going this year in fantasy? I have him tunes at running back uh, 12, and or maybe even 11, and he's 13th overall on my big board, so right at that first, second round turn. The guy was the running back four in fantasy, uh, and even running back three after he got traded to the uh, and to the Cardinals there, an absolute perfect fit. They were able to get rid of David Johnson too, so it just further secures that workload. Not that he wasn't the horse. He played over 70% of the snaps in all but one week with the Cardinals. And again, the running back three in fantasy, only Derrick Henry and Christian McCaffrey outscored this guy after he became an Arizona Cardinal. So he fits what they do perfectly. He's a great slashing style runner, but even better as a receiver. So I love Drake. I think he's going to, again, monopolize the, the 15 to 20 touches a week that he saw last year. Uh, and I think, again, he's, he's going to just eat it up. Um, so I'm all about Drake, especially if they make some offensive line improvements. And the fact that they get Hopkins only takes away pressure from the guy, stretches the defense even more, um, and, and gives him more chances for touchdowns. They love to run it in the red zone. We saw those four touchdown days from Drake. I, I think he has more of those multi-TD days. It could even be better after that RB3 performance. What are your thoughts on Chris Carson? Do you think he bounces back from the hip? Asks Daniel. And great to see you, Daniel. I'm glad you, you tuned in and found us, a, a loyal Wolfpack uh, member there. I do think uh, I, it's tricky. It, we got to see here. One thing I do love is they did not add any of these big, beefy free agent runners. You know, Pete Carroll loves to stockpile his running backs. Uh, so the fact that they didn't add those initially has me excited, Daniel, that it, he must be coming along well in his recovery. We'll have to see what happens in the draft here. Are they going to add another power style back to compete with him? I, I don't know yet, Daniel. We'll, we'll find out. If he's the guy, though, I mean, what's not to love after last year was top seven throughout the entire season, was just so consistent, too. One of the run-heaviest attacks. I think they stay that way. Although I will say Schottenheimer uh, and Pete Carroll especially has come out and hinted, maybe we get a little more explosive. Maybe we unleash Russell Wilson a bit more, give him more control at the line of scrimmage, similar to those Mahomesian led offenses. We know Wilson's at his most dangerous in comeback Russ mode. Uh, when they finally, he kind of bails this offense out. They run heavy, disgusting for three quarters. They get behind and then they unleash Wilson and he just balls out through the entire fourth quarter. Imagine we see that all game. So that might take a hit to Carson, although it also might give him more touchdown opportunities. If we see a little bit more of a high octane, no huddle style offense, could be even better in that type of situation. But it all comes down to health and what do they do in the draft. And I'm obviously not a doctor if I'm doing this shit. Uh, so I don't know what his hip situation is. There hasn't been any reports lately on it. Uh, so we have to just wait and see how is he recovering. That's a brutal injury to come back from. So we'll see. But again, a, a great fit, obviously, with a top 10 running back. And I don't see why he can't do that if he's healthy and still pegged for the same role. So I hope so, Daniel. So I signed on late and missed the Drake comments. So that was from last time, uh, Tunes. That was last uh, podcast, so you didn't miss anything this time. Uh, thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Content's killer. Kind words. That's why we do it is that the fans like you guys that come back and, and enjoy and interact with us. We love doing this stuff, my dude. So thank you so much. I appreciate your kind words. Uh, Tunebergs. With Rivers and Indy, who benefits the most? I love that question, Tunes. You're, you're asking the, the money one, so keep them coming all night. To me, it's a sneaky one. It's actually Naeem Hines, I think. I discussed this last broadcast, but I'm happy to reiterate it because I absolutely love this guy next year. I actually called him a potential top 15 PPR running back. You look at him, and I don't have the stats out in front of me right now, uh, but we saw Danny Woodhead have a 90-catch season, 78 catches. Austin Eckler, almost 1,000 yards and 90 catches. Rivers just loves peppering his running backs. Over 30% target share last year and consistently in four straight seasons has been top five at targeting that position. And Naeem Hines 
already has a 64 catch season under his belt. Uh, he's one of only like 30 running backs to have over a thousand receiving yards across his first two years to go with you know over a hundred catches. So the guy can get it done. He's already flashed those chops. We know it's a staple of the Frank Reich team to use that running back. And now he has the QB that loves to pepper the position most. So I think by far. Uh, it's Naeem Hines that benefits the most. I think Rivers himself, behind a better offensive line, also benefits. You know, T.Y. Hilton doesn't hurt to get a better quarterback than Jacoby Brissett. That deep ball does seem a little scattered these last couple seasons, so I'm not in love with it. Uh, but T.Y., but I think Naeem Hines, one of the best. Where do you rank Jacobs among running backs? Asked Danny Howland. Uh, imagine you're asking about Josh Jacobs. Believe off the top of my head, he's running back 12. So right in that running back fringe, I have Drake ahead of him. And in fact, Drake kind of ends that tier alongside Eckler and Chubb, uh, Aaron Jones, in my opinion, in that tier. So uh, Jacobs then jumps into that low end one, very high end running back two, a second rounder. I'd love to go running back, running back and have this guy as my number two. The big reason I think he could take a huge leap is they've already talked about getting him more involved in the passing game. Mike Mayock came out and said it's time to ramp those those receptions up. They did the re-sign Jalen Rashard, who's already been eating into that work a lot these last uh, last season. So uh, it's kind of a believe it when I see it. But if he gets that receiving work, there's no reason Jacobs can't go from a you know top 11, top 12 guy, which we saw regularly last year. Um, to a, a top five style guy. I do want to see what do they do at wide receiver because this offense is still lacking any type of threat to, to open up the box um, and, and generate those ge- greater scoring chances. So I need to see a better receiving presence, but you got to imagine they're going to address that in this year's draft. Uh, so I like Jacobs a lot. I also do want to make sure I see him get that work um, uh, and, and actually handle it too because he's never really h- held up to being a true featured back even last year missed two to three games never was the featured guy in college so I need to see that Patriots have four running backs that I feel can play asks Tune um, do you see them moving one up to free space if yes I, I could see them going from Burkhead he's got a pretty big cap hit uh, this year and kind of redundant talent to um, James White although he is so good in special teams too that he brings that that versatility that Belichick craves tunes, so uh, I don't know exactly who they'll move on for. I can't imagine they just cut bait with Sony after making him a first rounder. I still on an affordable deal, but after this year, I, I could see them getting rid of him um, with his contract going to be running out. So we'll see. I, I imagine the the only one I could see really leaving is Burkett. I can't imagine we get a huge return for any of the guys that we have on the roster, like a late round pick at most. So I imagine it'd be more so of a cut than anything here. Eckler scares me with the new QB. Uh, yeah, because as we mentioned, Rivers loves peppering those guys, his running backs. Uh, but ultimately, I do think it's part of the Anthony England scheme as well. Uh, Tyrod Taylor, I want to look back at his days. I remember McCoy had a very reception-heavy season with Tyrod Taylor at the reins of the offense. Uh, with Anthony Lynn as the play caller there too. So he's got some familiarity with Anthony Lynn's scheme. Uh, He's got some history of peppering running backs too. So I'm not, it's not Philip Rivers behind there, uh, which definitely hurts Eckler a little bit. But then getting Melvin Gordon removed, who had 41 receptions of his own, who, you know, was in on over 60% of the snaps once he came back. Eckler was the number two running back in fantasy when Melvin Gordon was out. Uh, So ultimately I could see that being a bigger offset of the quarterback factor, the fact that Melvin Gordon's no longer there is a greater boost than it is a, a hurt to lose Philip Rivers, if that makes sense. Um, I'm going to get back to run through these and ask these questions real quick to you guys. And I'll, I'll answer any more questions you guys have just in case to the podcast audience. Uh, we don't want to keep giving redundant information. So one other guy, or, or three other free agents to cover here. One is Brashad Perriman. He becomes that Robbie Anderson replacement. We saw him thrive after Mike Evans and Chris Godwin went down. It looked like the part of a true number one receiver and ate up. Uh, I think it was the one wide receiver five, I want to say, over those last three weeks of the season. Either way, he shouldered and, and showed he could shoulder a massive receiving workload. Uh, the, the big thing with him, huge body and burning 4-3-1 speed. So similar to Robbie Anderson, that long frame. And he's gonna probably slide in that similar role. But I do think he can offer a little bit more. And they really have nothing else there other than Jamison Crowder, who becomes a, the de facto clear-cut target hog. I just don't know if Darnold and a Jets-Adam Gase offense 
is something I'm going to be overly tied to anyways, but around 11, 12 sitting out there, don't be shocked if Perriman ends up returning, you know, Robbie Anderson style volume of last year, which had his, his four or five weeks of just dominating. I could see a few of those in the right matchups for Brashad Perriman. Also another free agent to wrap up all these loose ends. Nick Foles now going to the Bears on a trade. I'm not drafting Nick Foles. I mean, there's so many good quarterbacks. I have 25. I'd much rather have the Nick Foles. He's not going to be on my roster. I'd probably have 30. I'd rather have the Nick Foles, to be honest, uh, just because I can find someone that will shit out some running points. So, no, I, I don't love Nick Foles himself, but it is more accurate throws for Allen Robinson, who became that def- the, the number one vacuum. So that helps him out. He knows the, the Matt Nagy offense from their Philadelphia days. We all know, you know what happened when he just stormed down the field as the fucking Patriots all the time. They also have some Kansas City time together. So he's got familiarity with the scheme. He's played well in the scheme before. I, I just don't see him consistently returning value here. Uh, and last but not least in terms of names, but Devin Funches is going to the Packers. Who gives a fuck? One Devin Funches sucks. Got hurt last year, so we don't really know. He's a big body, so he might win a few jump ball TDs. But two... What number two wide receiver did we ever care about last year on the Packers? MVS sucked. Geronimo Allison, blue. There's nobody worth owning as a number two receiver because it's a run-heavy attack. It, a lot of the passing game gets funneled to the running backs there too. So it's all about peppering your hog, Devontae Adams, making sure he just gets look after look after look. I don't think there's going to be nearly enough volume to make Devin Funches viable this year. Now the questions I want to ask you guys, and feel free to comment and answer me here. One, what are the Bucks going to do at running back? They still have that gaping need. Is Ronald Jones actually going to be the answer there? Ugh, that'd be pretty damn scary if so. I can't imagine a, a, a scheme with Tom Brady being there that's historically so reliant on running backs actually going in with Rojo, who's a average at best, probably below average pass catcher and a horrendous pass protector. Uh, that's going to He'll never last on the field with Brady back there. So ultimately, I expect them to make a move at running back. Hopefully they draft a big three-down horse who would be a low-end running back one because this offense is going to put up points because Brady's going to pepper whoever it is back there. Maybe they take uh, the LSU guy and Claire Edward, whatever the fuck's name. I can't even think of it off the top of my head. Uh, but monster receiver would be a beautiful fit in a round two uh, for this offense. Maybe Cam Akers, another great receiver, big play threat. Uh, I can see those guys thriving there but that's obviously something you have to monitor there the other thing that you got to monitor moving forward in this draft is are we going to get any running back competition for some guys who avoided free agents that i didn't expect to like james connor still unscathed top of the depth chart there for pittsburgh we know they love their workhorse we know connor's been a top five back there before i thought they were going to definitely make a big investment at running back because it's such a huge part of their offense and he's been so unreliable i mean last year what do you make it through two full games he had like 18 different injuries what the fuck so who knows what's going to happen there but for right now it's a vote of confidence we'll see what happens in the draft here but if he continues to be unscathed there uh james connor could be a monster value in a rebound potential situation. You got to also wonder what's going to happen with, say, Raheem Mostert blew up, so five touchdowns across the playoffs, nearly 400 yards in three games. The guy was a monster for this team. Great, perfect fit for the one cut and go with that 4 3 speed. Uh, monster vision as well. Just became a revelation in that Shanahan zone blocking scheme. Was a top 10 running back once he took over. Seems to me like they're going to let him again be that number one guy. They haven't added anyone else yet, so keep your eyes peeled on those two backfields and what might happen uh, moving forward. And last but not least, I had one other uh, question I wanted to ask there, and that's lingering quarterbacks. Where's Cam Newton? Where's Jameis Winston? Where are these guys going to go at this point? Who's going to be the quarterback for the Patriots? Is it going to be either of those guys? Because they both have talent. I mean, Jameis Winston led the league in passing last year. Cam Newton is the most dangerous dual threat when healthy. Those guys have the potential to be fantasy forces, but where are they going to end up? Is one going to go to the Chargers? Is someone going to end up in Miami? Will either end up in New England? I have no idea. It's definitely a storyline to follow. Alrighty, folks, those are my questions, so please let me know what you think of them. And also, let's get to your questions here. Daniel Hallen, am I crazy or does the CMC scare you? New coach, new QB. Daniel, 
Are you really scared? You are crazy. That is ridiculous to be scared of Christian McCaffrey, and I'll tell you why. One, Teddy Bridgewater is a far more accurate passer than anyone Christian McCaffrey has ever played with. The anticipation throws the underneath routes. Teddy Bridgewater loves checking down, and there's not a better check down weapon in the league than Christian McCaffrey. Number two, Joe Brady is all about getting his weapons in space and versatility. He's going to scheme up. You saw what he did at LSU, I hope. Uh, one of the most creative, innovative, the next wonderkin, I like to call him, in the NFL. I think his offense is going to take the league by storm. He comes from the Saints system where they thrive on using running backs in the passing game and uh, those quick routes. Think about Kamara and all the unique route concepts that guy has thrown at him. Christian McCaffrey is that much better than him. So no, I think the offense takes a huge step forward as a whole, which means more touchdowns for Christian McCaffrey. I think he gets similar receiving usage. I do think the, the carries go down a little bit, but ultimately I think that's offset by being in a more explosive, I think he's a, a style attack, more touchdowns, just more overall efficiency. I love Christian McCaffrey. I think he's a beautiful, perfect fit for any offense, but especially this one. So no, I am not scared at all, Daniel Howland. How do I feel about Josh Allen tunes? I love that question because I love Josh Allen. I have him above Matt Ryan, you asked about earlier. My quarterback six this year right now, Josh Allen, already, I mean, he was quarterback six last year, the number two quarterback from week seven on where they finally decided to uncork it, go 11 personnel, three wide receivers. And that was when they had nobody to really throw to. John Brown, Cole Beasley, both solid, but no true number one. Now you give him Stephon Diggs, the definition of a true number one. Uh, many people consider him the best route runner in the game. So you give him that type of personnel to just operate what they were doing the second half of the year to perfection. And he was already the quarterback too. We know the rushing upside, uh, you know, led the league in rushing touchdowns in back-to-back -back seasons. He's going to again be a good threat for six to 10 scores on the ground with now better passing options. Uh, his deep ball is obviously, he's got the cannon arm, but it's been hideous. His accuracy on the deep ball has been awful, but he gets one of the best ball trackers and best deep weapons in Stephon Diggs, led the league in deep yardage and deep touchdowns last year. So if that even helps him take a, a decent step forward in his deep passing game, look out. The guy could be the top quarterback in fantasy. So I love Josh Allen this year. I am all about him. 2020 rushing champion. Are you saying Ronald Jones? Or who are you saying? My guess is obviously Derrick Henry for the 2020 rushing champion. Uh, if not him, though, I love Nick Chubb, especially if Kareem Hunt somehow shakes out of there. I think Nick Chubb is going to eat in Kevin Stefanski's running scheme. Chargers likely going to go with Tyrod and a rookie. That's the report, CJ. Uh, that they said they're happy with the guy, but if Cam Newton and or Jameis Winston are going to settle for you know cheap one-year prove-it style deals, why not at least get him in there? Uh, Tune says, I could see Winston uh, <laughs> packing groceries in Miami <laughs> or Cam, Cam in Miami. I, that, that's the rumbling to the heavy betting favorites right now to land Cam. But they already have Ryan Fitzpatrick, who's well-versed in the Chan Gailey spread attack they're going to be operating this year. He was actually the quarterback seven in that system not too long ago with the Jets. Uh, and Ryan Fitzpatrick was the quarterback four over the second half of last year, which is just mind blown to think of. Um, but this guy has proven he knows he, he can be that bridge. So why bring in another bridge style guy if they're going to end up taking Tua or whoever uh, at the top of the draft there? So to me, it's they're the betting favorite, and I could see them uh, potentially fitting in Cam Newton. But this is a spread offense about you know quick dinking and dunking, Chan Gailey style offense. I don't know that I love that fit. Feel like Miami will just yeah I agree with you, um, uh, Chris. Although your spell, spelling of tutoring is horrible, Corey Wilkes. What round are we taking Brady? Uh, he's elevated to my quarterback uh, seven, right behind Josh Allen, right behind Drew Brees, who I think jumped up now to my quarterback four with Emmanuel Sanders offered there. Um, so I, I like Brady though so much in this Bruce Arians no risk it no biscuit attack now it looks like an odd fit on paper but they've talked at length about since Brady got signed about how he the big reason he joined there is he's excited about the Arian scheme he talked about how he watched it for years and years with Carson Palmer operating it and how he got excited about his potential to operate he, he cited all the concepts and routes Brady's clearly been doing his homework and he said he wanted to go there so up to operate the scheme. So clearly Brady, and I think, you know, everyone, his deep ball's not good enough. He can't sling it down. Still there. Um, where do I rank Bridgewater? Great question, Daniel Howland. Um, 
We back? I hope so. Let me know if uh, if, uh, if those are running. But uh, I, I rank Bridgewater at QB 12. I like that question. But uh, Corey, if you're still there, Brady, my QB 7. The, I mean, the weapons, what gets better than Chris Godwin and Mike Evans? I, I imagine they're going to make a backfield mo- move there. O.J. Howard, an explosive option outside um, uh, at tight end there. I, it's just the weapons, the system. Jameis Winston threw 5,000 than 30 touchdowns. I don't think Brady will hit quite the lofty passing yards. He protects the ball too well. But you take off half those interceptions, you keep the touchdowns, and, and he approaches 5,000 yards, it's going to be something special. So I'm all about it. Um, where do I rank? Uh, I already answered that. Bridgewater, my QB 12. But he's going to go a lot later than that. He's going to be my number one locked in QB 2. I take in every league, Daniel. Um, I see Cam there. And getting Tua, he learns the running game. Yeah, I see that too, Tunes. I think that's a, a good call there. All right, folks, I don't know if this is frozen, what the fuck's going on with it, uh, but ultimately, if you're tuned in, I appreciated it so much. Good interaction, as always, with you guys. Thanks so much for asking the questions and keeping them coming and sticking with me for an hour or show. If you're on the podcast, Fantasy Fullback Dive, we paid that path to 2020 titles. Thanks so much for listening. If you haven't already reviewed us, it means the world to us to hear it. And if you don't follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Roto Street Journal on both, Roto ST Journal on Twitter, and me personally, Roto Street Wolf on Twitter would be happy to interact all day uh, about fantasy football, especially right now. What else do we have to do? Just talking football. Uh, so thanks again, guys. Greatly appreciate it. Um, and let's let's catch up again. See ya.